No, I got a lot of pages here. Uh, yeah. Shall we start <clears throat> at number one? This looks familiar. Did we do this one already? Um, we got. I asked. No, we just got this packet. Okay. All right. Uh, I must have had another student that had similar questions. Um, all right. You want to just start at one and go down? Yeah. Okay. Unless you've already done some of them. Is the first one a function? Um, no. Why? Because they both have three and two in the same one. No. Actually, it is a function. And the reason is, is that what makes something not a function is what happens in B. And what happens in B is that for a given value of X, here, let me take a snapshot of this. In B, when X is 3, it gives you two different values for Y. Okay. In other words, if I tried to plot that over here and I go to 3 on the x-axis and it tells me, well, y is 3, but it's also 4, well, immediately that flunks the vertical line test. Mm -hmm. okay? It's a little confusing because over here you have two values of y, but that's okay. If I were to plot these points, notice there's 1. And then, um, excuse me, gosh, hold on a second. All right, let's, let's go from left to right. When X is minus three, Y is two, that point's on there. When X is minus one, Y is zero, that point's on there. When x is 0, y is 1. And when x is 2, y is 2. And when x is 3, y is 3. Now, you'd, I could connect the dots, but you don't need to to know that that passes the vertical line test. Technically, mm -hmm. I cannot connect the dots. We don't know if this is a continuous function or not. It's all they've done is given us a table that has a very restricted domain and a very restricted range. But you can certainly, in your mind, picture connecting those dots, and now it still passes the vertical line test, right? No matter where I draw a vertical line, it only gives me one value of y. Whereas okay. over here, I don't need to even uh, plot the other three points. I can immediately tell that when X is 3, I get two different values for Y. Well, that fails the function test. In other words, I would not be able to pass a vertical line through that without it hitting two points on the Y axis. All right. Let's go to the next one. So, how do I, this is a, uh, another way of saying the way they've put this problem, that's the same thing as saying what is F of Okay. So how do I calculate f of 4? You would do negative 2 times 4 and then add 19. Do that. So negative 8 plus 19, which is 11. Okay. Now in B, I'll let you fill in this. I'll use it for writing space. So here we're doing f of what? Negative 2. Okay. And first fill it in and then evaluate it, always. Don't, all, don't try to do these in one step. I tell that to everybody, not you. 
that's where mistakes come from is when people try to do multiple steps at once. So first of all, just do the first step. Fill, fill in. So two times negative two. And then subtract the five. And then negative four minus five. Then that's one, negative one. Hold on. Wait, no. It's a very common error. When you have negative four minus five, that's the same as saying negative four plus a negative five. So that's it would be negative nine. nine. Uh-huh. Okay. Now what's the absolute value of negative nine? Uh, Always the number without the sign. The absolute value of positive nine is nine, and the absolute value of negative nine is nine. Okay. What those absolute value signs mean is what is the size of the number, regardless of its sign. In this case, it's nine. But you cannot make that mistake. You'll get the wrong answer because if you could, if you'd have put anything that was one, you'd have gotten the wrong answer. So make sure you do this subtraction accurately. Okay, over here we got f of minus one. Lay it out for me. So it'll be negative one squared. And parentheses are very important here. If I don't put the parentheses around that, I get a different answer. Negative 1 in parentheses squared is not the same as negative 1 squared. It's a different number. One is minus 1, the other becomes plus 1. So get in a habit of always putting what you're substituting in parentheses, whether it's a positive or a negative number. Okay. Okay. Now evaluate. So it'll be one minus five plus one. Okay. Equals what? Negative three. Mm -hmm. I do these in my head by doing those two first and getting two, and then I do two minus five, rather than doing them one step at a time. I find it easier. I'm more accurate. If I do it one step at a time, well, that minus that is minus four, and then I got to add one to that. I still get minus three, but it's a little easier if I add the two positive numbers first and then subtract the other number. Yeah. Okay. Graph each equation. Use a straight edge to draw a straight line. That's on the next page? Yeah. Okay, let me go backwards here. Um, oops. Okay. It's this page. Yeah. Now this would be the one time it'd be cool if you had a graphing tablet. Because this GoToMeeting program allows me to make you the presenter. And this problem is graph it. And the only way I've ever been able to deal with this is to have you tell me where do I start, what do I do next. Which isn't okay. bad. In other words, it's, it's another way of, of having you do it. But it would be better if I could watch you do it. Uh, on your uh, piece of paper, just like I'm going to with your instructions. So the first one, where do I start? So you start on the six okay. on the Y. Okay, good. That's the Y intercept. And then you go up one and then right three. Good. Most people would say up and over. And then you connect those two dots, mm -hmm. only using a straight edge. 
Okay, what do I do to B to graph it? Uh, Got two ways oh. I can I can graph B. There's two really easy ways. Um, how would you graph it? What would you do first? Would you go? What? Uh, oh, that's confusing. <laughs> well, let's talk about the two ways. First of all, we can put this so that y is all by itself on the left side, like the first one. And in order to do that, I got to subtract the 4x. So I could say y equals minus 4x plus 8. And now it's pretty easy to graph, right? Mm -hmm. How would you graph that? So go to negative 4. No. Well, Always start at the y-intercept. Oh, yeah. So go up 8. Mm -hmm. one, and then what? Um, and then go down 4 and left 1. Well, if I do that, if I go down 4 and left 1, what kind of slope do I have? Uh... Negative correlation? Oh, those two lines make a positive slope. So you're correct that it's four and one, but always make sure that you end up with this slope that it says. It's got a negative slope here. So it must be, I gotta go down four and right one. And now when I connect those two points, I have a negative slope. Okay. I'm going to give you a slightly easier way to do this. And it's worth remembering, but mm, depends. And when you start dealing with inequalities where you have to shade one side or the other, do it the first way. Solve for y and then do it that way. But this happens to be in standard format, okay? And one really easy way to graph it where you don't have to deal with slope is to graph the x-intercept and the y-intercept. Well, how do you figure out the y-intercept? Subtract it? No, you let x equals zero. In other words, when you're on the y-intercept, isn't x zero? Yeah. So if I let x be 0, I get y equals 8 immediately. That's my y-intercept. And now let's figure out the x-intercept. Well, what is y when you're on the x-axis? Uh, 4? No, always. What is y? No matter where I'm at on the x-axis, if my point is on the x-axis, y is? Oh, 0. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to let y equal 0 and solve for x. What do you get? Mm. What do you get when you let y equal 0 and solve that the rest of that equation for x? 4? What's 8 divided by 4? Oh, 2. Okay, so there's our x-intercept. And now... I still have the same straight line I had before, only it was easier. I didn't have to deal with slope. In other words, when you graph a line that's in standard format and you do it by finding the x and y intercepts, which are relatively easy, then you don't deal with slope. You just put your two points and connect it with a straight edge. And Usually when they give it to you like this, they make it everything nice and divisible. In other words, they didn't put 9 over there. They put 8 because 8 is cleanly divisible by 4. So you're going to get a whole number for each x and y intercept. It's going to be a lot quicker to graph by doing the x and y intercept. Keep track of the time here. If I, if I go over, warm me. 
Okay. I'm notorious for going over. Um, all right. How do I graph C? You just go to negative three on the Y axis. Okay. There's negative three. And now what? Um, no, it's not a point. It's a line. Yeah. Y equals negative three. What, how do I draw the line? Would it be horizontal? Yep. All horizontal lines are y equals some number. And the number that it equals is always the point on the y-intercept. So if it was y equal 2, I'd go to 2 and draw a horizontal line. Okay? And x equals some number. What kind of lines are these? Vertical. Okay. Where do I start? You just go to negative five. Two, three, four, five. Boy, I hate this new system where they don't label the grid. I've been getting so many students that give me these grids that you have to count instead yeah. of having a five on there that you could read. You know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. Okay. I don't understand why they do it that way either. Uh, let's go to number four. Write an equation in slope intercept form of a line with these properties. First of all, tell me what slope intercept form is. Is that y equals mx plus b? Huh? That's the general form. That's really the way to start all math problems, is to figure out what the general equation is. And then it's pretty pretty simple. What, what do the M and B stand for? M is slope. Okay. And then B is the y-intercept. Okay. So what's the equation of this line? Um, a half. I'm sorry? A half. Y equals Read the whole thing. Yeah. Y equals what? Y equals one half X uh, plus two. You got it. Okay. And the second one, B. This is a little harder, right? Yeah. In other words, I because they didn't give us the Y intercept. We're still going to work off of that formula. And the only thing we know is slope. So I know that y, well, I know something else, but the primary thing we, we know is slope. So I can get that far, but I can't come up with the general equation without solving for b. How do I solve for b? Hmm. Here's our point that has to be on the line. Mm. Any point that is on a straight line, no matter where it's at, has to satisfy the equation. In other words, if I plug that point in for the X and Y values, it's always going to work. And in this case, it's going to let me solve for B. What should I plug in for y? The negative 3. Okay, so I got negative 3 equals the 1. I can, I don't need the 1, but what do I plug in for x? 2. Now solve that for b. Uh. Uh, negative five. Yeah. Um, so now what's the equation? In other words, it's all we did was solve for B. I still haven't written the equation yet. We want to write the equation in the general format, which is Y equals what? So it'll be Y equals one X minus five. There you go. And there you have it. Now, Haley, 
Yes. Using a calculator to do these single digit additions and subtractions is going to slow you down immensely with your advancement through mathematics. Okay? okay. Now, let me suggest a fix for you. I may have told you about this website. I'm not sure if I have, but I'm curious to see something, which is I have some students that they're terrible at solving equations, and I put them on this website, and all of a sudden they are Albert Einstein. Um, Flashcards, positive and negative numbers. Okay. Here's what I want you to do without a calculator. And if you can't do it, we'll stop and talk about it. Don't worry. I'll show you how to do these. Okay. What is the answer here? Negative three. Next, I want you to do them as fast as you can without a calculator. Uh. Four? Negative four? Ne always figure out the sign first. In other words, when I look at this problem, I know it's going to be negative because I'm dividing a positive number by a negative number. Or if I'm dividing a negative number by a positive number. If I've got different signs, my answer is negative. Four is correct. Okay, go ahead. It, negative it, three. Yeah, I think it is helpful to think about it mentally to figure out what the sign is first which you can do when you're multiplying and dividing. Negative 10. Uh, two. You know the rules of nines? Very, very uh, helpful. Here, let me show you them. It's pretty fascinating also, but once you learn them, you never miss a nines anymore. And this is why. Nine times two is 18. Those two digits add to nine. Nine times three is 27. Those two digits add to nine. You can multiply nine by any number you want, and the two digits always add to nine. 9 times 12 is 108. Those three digits add to 9. Okay? And notice something else. If I'm stepping through and I'm multiplying 9 times 6, my first digit is always one less than this number. So my first digit is automatically 5, which makes my next digit have to be 4 for it to add to 9. But if you remember your rules of nines, you'll never miss another nine. In other words, we know that 54 divided by nine is the same basic problem as nine times six equals 54. In other words, if I divide both sides by nine, I get 54 divided by six or by nine is six. Is it a positive or a negative? Positive. Uh -huh. You will just find that if you get good at this, it'll make your math ten times easier. It really will. Right now, when I give you a problem like this, nah, hold on. When you encounter a problem like this, it causes you to stop, pause, think, and you're not sure of your answer. Okay? Now, the reason that's confusing is because I'm looking at two dashes. The thing is, is that one of the dash means negative and one of the dash means subtraction. Which one means negative? The nine. Right. So, what I tell everybody to do is take all subtraction problems and turn them into addition problems. Just do that, but it means you have to change the sign on what was being subtracted. 
So those two problems are the same. The only thing is, is that nobody misses that one. Everybody instantly says minus 16 because they know how to add 9 and 7. And since they're both negative, we know that the answer is negative. But when they're presented with a problem like that, about half my students miss that. And you can't miss these. You can't. And I hate to see you rely on your calculator because once you rely on your calculator, you can never memorize it. You won't. I guarantee it. Just the memorization process does not take place unless you make a definite effort to master these. And I'm only wanting you to master single digit stuff. I don't care about two digits. Okay. In other words, uh, who, who cares uh, what 12 times 17 is? You can do that on a calculator. But you don't want to have to do these on a calculator. It slows you down too much. What's this? Uh, 54. Adding. Don't mix up multiplication with adding. Uh, uh, 15. We're adding two negative numbers. Remember, there's a difference between multiplying two negative numbers, which is positive, and adding two negative numbers, which is always negative. You just add the two numbers and you carry the negative sign. So it's negative 15. Uh, negative 24. Four. These are just kind of spit out at random. One. No. Any number multiplied by zero is zero, no matter what it is. That could be one million. One million times zero is zero. Uh, four, negative 48. Again, figure out the sign first when you're multiplying. What's the sign going to be here? Uh, uh, negative. No, we're multiplying. A negative times a negative is a positive. It's only when we're adding where a negative plus a negative is still negative, always, no matter the size of the numbers. But when you're multiplying the two negative signs, when you're multiplying or dividing, if you have negatives in both, it's positive. Only addition and subtraction are actually much, much harder than multiplication, believe it or not. They are. It's with addition and subtraction that it's confusing. I have very few students that are confused by multiplication. So that's a plus 70. 15. Nine. Ten. Ten. When you're adding an even number to another even number, has to be even. Nine is an odd number, so it's one way to think about it. Uh, negative ten. Good. Negative six. Okay. Now, let me, let me say something. If you would spend five minutes a day on this site, five minutes, that's all, just doing it in your head as fast as you can, you would see an amazing effect on your math skills. You really would. And it's difficult to explain why, but it shouldn't be that difficult to understand because you're seeing how many of these you have to do to solve a typical equation. In other words, when you are solving an equation, you have to do tons of these. You usually have to do four or five of these per equation to get to the final step. And you just don't want to be glued to a calculator to do that. Not when they are single digit numbers or two numbers like this. Uh, and the only way to do it is to memorize it and practice it. You can't afford to be wrong even once out of 10, because what's going to happen is if you only are correct 90% of the time, you're going to give it up and go to the calculator when you take a test, right? 
Yeah. Calculator is correct 100% of the time. The problem is the moment you do that, you lose your ability to memorize it. I cannot tell you how many students I have that don't do well on this because they never memorized it. Going all the way back, you, you grew up in a calculator age. I did not. I grew up with before the calculator was invented, so you had to memorize these. There was no other way to do math. But uh, so you're at a bit of a disadvantage in the fact that you've always lived with calculators. But you just kind of have to force yourself to not live with calculators and know how to do these. Otherwise, you'll just struggle with algebra, geometry, and anything else that comes above that. All right. Hey, okay. I'm going to uh, let you go. Uh, this is eMath Labs flashcards. If you're okay. interested in saving that site or going to it and practicing. But that's certainly what I would recommend.